Howdy readers, I'm Jason, this is chapter and verse, and uh, this is Lukash from Totally Pretentious, who is uh, visiting me and Kelly uh, this weekend, before he uh, tomorrow heads on up to see Devil's Tower, before heading home. So, uh, as promised, this is the video on uh, body of work. Uh, Meditations on Mortality from the Human Anatomy Lab by Christine Montross. And uh, I was going to review this at the end of June, uh, which was when I was supposed to do this, um, for my uh, mortality project, uh, which is called You Carry a Coffin Today, uh, Mortality in Literature and Film, in which I spend the year uh, moving through uh, books and films that deal with the issue of death. Uh, but I knew that Lukash had read the book for the project last month, and so I thought it would be fun for us to just engage in conversation or dialogue uh, about it while he was here. So that's why this video is coming to you later than planned. Um, so before we get into that, uh, just a couple of things about the book. Uh, Christine Montross, uh, before she went to medical school to become a doctor, uh, she uh, got her MFA in poetry, and so she was trained as a poet, and so uh, this book, which is part memoir, part history, um, I think for me really benefits uh, from the fact that she brings the eye of a poet and the sensibility of a poet to the subject matter. I have read this before, I have taught it before, I'm only halfway through my reread right now, but I feel like I'm comfortable enough with it to be able to chat about it with Lukash. So that is the intro. Um, Lukash came to this book for the first time uh, reading it last month and so I guess I'll just begin by asking you uh, what were your uh, impressions of it as a whole I suppose and also um, what it specifically had to say about uh, mortality and mm -hmm. about our relationship to mortality. Yeah. Okay, so my first impression that I want to get off my chest, which is going to sound negative, but I don't mean it to be negative, but I feel like the subtitle is a bit of almost a misnomer, because it makes it sound like the whole book is going to be directly talking about mortality and death in the anatomy lab. Um, and I feel like a lot of it, it isn't quite about that. It's about like the history of doing dissections and uh, about be training to become a medical practitioner and uh, things such as that, which are still super interesting, but I just feel like it's odd that the subtitle doesn't quite represent what the entire book's about that accurately. But that aside, talk about just the contents. Um, it was uh, interesting. I mean, it's, just, I guess, a world that I've just never been exposed to before. Yeah. Um, obviously, I haven't been to medical school, but neither has anyone I've ever known. And um, I think... Um, so yeah, that was all very interesting, and everything I learned about the history of cadavers and dissection was very interesting, just stuff I didn't ever think about before. But um, in terms of its relationship to mortality, I think the biggest thing that I came away with was um, how the sort of, um, a lot of the th things we think of as representing someone who is alive are not actually necessarily like, are not necessarily qualities that actually have anything to, to, anything to do with being alive. Because gotcha. she talks a lot about um, how, like, when she holds the cadaver, a cadaver's hand for the first time, and how that feels like this really weirdly intimate thing to be doing, even though it's obviously a dead body. Um, or uh, dissecting its brain. When she gets to the head, it just feels like this huge defilement of this person, because... Um, you're used to looking at a physical body and seeing a live person. So that was the biggest takeaway, was how, like, when we look at a person physically, we think um, as a lot of their physicality as representing an alive person, even though really it's not, which I guess goes to sort of the weird question of, like, what makes a person actually a person, I guess. Um, well, I think that's what... A lot of this book is about is is what what constitutes personhood you know what makes us um, more than just the sum of our parts 
what makes us more than just our bones and our flesh and our muscle and all the other shit that, I mean, again, yeah, you don't think about uh, because we haven't been to medical school. It's just it's fascia and all of this stuff, layers of fat, and, and uh, there's so much more to the body. Uh, what makes us more than that, somehow? Uh, because I think, in de even in death, I think that we, our bodies point toward that, right? So, I mean, one of the, one of the parts that I marked in the book, um, uh, she says, uh, yeah, she says, uh, so, so on the first day of, of the semester, right, they pick up what's called a bone box. And, uh, and in that box, um, which they take home and they can inventory and start studying, it's most of a human skeleton. And she's carrying it across campus and she just keeps thinking about the box. This used to be a person. This used to be a person. And um, she gets the box home and, uh, and there's this brief paragraph. She said, the skull has a full set of teeth and one of the incisors had been crowned, as I can see from the whittled shape. I think someone kissed this mouth. Someone touched this chin in love. And, uh, and what I love about that is that at this point, it's just bone, right? It's, it's literally, it's just, it's an artifact, really. Uh, but the pieces of it harken back to um, those moments, right? Those moments when um, it was, I mean, the, the skeleton was alive and it was experiencing love and it was experiencing disappointment and anguish. And, and, uh, and so... Where does one thing stop and where does the other thing begin? If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think it's it's uh, it's a book that is sort of negotiating the um, the difficulty of of holding both of those things in tandem at the same time, right? Our physicality, our cor corporeality, uh, with whatever it is that makes us uh, more than just those things, whether right. it's yeah. Whether it's the energy and the electricity in the brain, or whether it's the soul, what have you, um, the, the act of being alive. So, as I mentioned in a previous video, I'm in physical therapy right now for my shoulders. And um, so one day, I'm in physical therapy, and I'm, I don't know how many of you have been through physical therapy, but it's, it's not fun. But I was laying on a roller on this, on this bed, and uh, stretching my arms out, and trying to kind of lengthen... The muscles of my, and it's really fascinating reading this while you're in physical therapy, and your physical therapist is like, oh, right, we're going to do scapular contractions now, and I'm like, oh, okay, I know, I know what that's all about. Um, but thinking about my muscles, and thinking about how some of them have been uh, tightened over time because of how I sit at my desk, and how the muscles uh, around my shoulder blades have been lengthened because I just hadn't been using them properly. And uh, so I'm laying on this roller, stretching these muscles out, and uh, she's talking, she's, you know, helping me, but she's also in conversation with another physical therapist. And they start, she has no idea that I'm reading this book at this time, and, um, and she starts talking about uh, her anatomy class when she was going to school, and, um, and how the cadaver that they were working on, you could still see the mark on the ring finger from the wedding band, and how it troubled her. And she just, she's just had a difficult time being able to do the work on the cadaver, thinking of it as a person who was married. Or like when in the, in the book when Christine Montrose um, looks at the face of her cadaver and um, it's just like, oh my gosh, she's beautiful. And yeah, and she yeah, didn't expect this, her to be. Yeah, it's this really profound experience. And they name her Eve, and, um, which is a little bit corny, but... Anyway, um, but they name her Eve, um, and, uh, yeah, I feel like, you know, because just with the way we interact with people every day, we're conditioned to think of interactions between body parts as signifying personhood, and yet, intellectually, when you look at a cadaver, intellectually, you tell yourself, well, this isn't a person, but because you've been conditioned to think of a body as a person because you interact with people every day physically in one, in one degree or another um, you can't help it just because you're conditioned to think of it that way. One of the things that the book did uh, for me, that I think the first time I read it, but more so this time 
is it reminded me of uh, specific scenes from other books and more precisely from other movies um, that, that deal with death and that deal with um, our treatment of bodies, I suppose, uh, once, once death is, is, has happened, is final. Um, in particular, I won't, and I won't go into the scene because Akash hasn't read the book or seen the film, uh, but the, those of you who have seen the film of uh, Never Let Me Go, uh, Kazuo Ishiguro's novel, um, that, that last scene in the movie uh, with, with uh, Andrew Garfield's character, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, but also in Kundun, have you ever seen Kundun? No. Mark Scorsese's Kundun about the, uh, the Dalai Lama. And um, so this young boy, right, I mean, they discover he's the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama. Um, and then when he's a young man, his father dies, okay, and he hasn't had a lot of connection with his father since since being found to be the Dalai Lama, and um, and then what they do with his father's body, they take his father's body out, and there's it's not a burial, it's not a funeral, or anything like this. Um, they literally cut his father up, and they strip all of the meat off the bones, and he's present for this. He's not you know involved in it, but um, but he's kind of overseeing it, and this is just a practice in that culture. And they strip all the meat and flesh off of his father's bones, and they throw it to the vultures, um, so that his father can essentially be put to use. Um, his his father's body can be put to use and recycled. Um, and it reminded me as well of A Midnight Clear, which was a film directed by Keith Gordon based on a William Wharton novel. It's a World War One or a World War Two story, excuse me. And um, and there's a scene in that movie where. Um, the character play, played by Frank Whaley, who they call Mother, if I remember right. It's been a long time since I've seen it. He dies, and, uh, and they, they bring his body in, and, you know, they're in a villa, and it's wintertime, and um, they heat a bathtub of water, and they, they put their friend's naked body um, into this water, and his friends bathe his body. Uh, his dead body, and they clean the crusted blood out of the bullet holes and everything. And that's just one of the things that this book did for me, uh, is, is made me think about what it says, I suppose, about us, how we treat the bodies of, of the dead. Well, she goes in at some length into cultural differences and how cadavers are treated. Um, yeah. She looks at, uh, I think, Iraq, Nigeria, and Thailand. And, mm -hmm. and the United States, obviously, um, and how I think it was the Nigerian medical students, or one of the Nigerian medical students, who um, in Nigeria they um, don't have quite the same system that we have in the U.S., where people like donate their bodies to science, um, and so uh, they use the dead bodies of criminals, um, which she also says they did used to in the U.S. and in Europe, but yeah. they still do it in Nigeria. And so some of the Nigerian medicals, or one of the Nigerian medicals, says something like, oh yeah, I'm like, I'm glad to be doing this because I'm punishing this horrible person. Um, uh, and, uh, and she was kind of troubled by that, how this person was like taking a weird, um, sadistic, pl not pleasure perhaps, but was glad of what they were doing to this cadaver. But then she looked at Thailand where, um, like, the person who donated their body is, like, exalted, and there's this whole ceremony. Yeah, um, it's looked at as a teacher. Yeah, yeah, and the, there's even a ceremony. They even give them, an, like, an honorific title and everything. Um, and I can't remember if the person in that in Thailand who whose cadaver is meaning, I can't remember whether they donated their body or whether it was, like, it was probably that they donated, I can't remember. But, yeah, that was very interesting. And, and like... What um, what came to my mind in that, too, was how in Thailand, at least looking at Thailand, since that's the one she talks about, um, but um, how they have a greater emphasis on, well, because we have the idea in the West, too, but like this idea of memento mori, you know, you must remember, you must die. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the way that she talks about how in Thailand they treat dead bodies for uh, dissection, uh, they have a much greater sense of reminding people that this is what happens to you, you're, you know, everything you might do you might think is super important, but you're just going to die, <laughs> you know. Um, they have a, they, that sense seems a lot more uh, salient to 
them in that cult in that one culture, um, at least versus the U.S., where I think we sort of try to live forgetting that we die, <laughs> that yeah. we're gonna die. <laughs> yeah, we do. Um, well, I mean, so not to give too much away, but Lukash and I saw uh, Midsummer last night, and one of the things in Midsummer, so it's about this cult and. When members of the cult reach the age of 72, um, they volunteer, they volunteer their own deaths. And, uh, and I was mortified watching it. Uh, it's a great movie, but that scene mortified me. And uh, the characters, the, the American characters and the British characters in the film were mortified. Um, and then one of the cult members tries to explain it. This is how we do things. Um, and you, you guys put people into nursing homes, etc., etc., and that seems very strange and alien to us. And um, it's, it's fascinating because you find yourself watching that film. Part of you find yourself going, oh, that makes a lot of sense. I, I, I get that. But then you, then you remember what happens to, these, uh, to this, this 72-year-old man and 72, 72-year-old woman. And you're like, oh, no, nursing home seems like a good idea. I, you know, it's, 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 it's weird how cultures approach these things differently. And I think that we can look at that, that cult in the film as its distinct culture, right? It's, it exists within the Western world, but very much so apart from the Western world. So one of the things I'm curious about, Lukash, uh, is when you were reading this book, did it make you, and we've never talked about this, I mean, what you, you, know, what you want done with your body after you, after you die, um, did this book make you rethink or kind of re-examine what, what you would like to have done, whether you want to be cremated or buried or have your body donated uh, to be used in, in medical schools like this? Because I find myself wondering about it as I'm reading. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I... I don't know. I didn't consider... Well, it did cross my mind thinking about whether or not I might want to have my body donated. Um, ever since... so. Um, you know the show, uh, Adam Ruins Everything? No, I don't know. Oh, okay. Well, it's the show where this guy named Adam just, um, goes into these different areas of, of the world and just sort of ruins them. Um, and, um, uh, so one of the episodes he did, just as the example that's relevant, is, uh, funerals. And, uh, he talks about how, um how uh, environmentally unfriendly everything we do to dead bodies is, essentially, because it uses up a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. And that even cremating is actually uses a up a lot of energy. Um, uh, and actually the most environmentally friendly way to, to treat a dead body is to stick it in a biodegradable sack and just sort of bury it in the ground somewhere in the woods, basically, because then it'll just biodegrade and, and that'll be all. Um, so that's what I thought I would like done with my body for a long time. Although it's hard to have your that done with someone's body because that's not widely accepted in um, at least in the U.S. There are certain, I think there are a couple places in the U.S. where you can have that done to a recently deceased, but it's hard to have your that done. Before. So that's what I always thought. But um, this was the first reading this book was the first time where I considered um, donating my body. Um, but I think they just. They just cremate the bodies after they yeah. finish. Yeah. yeah. So it would essentially be having yourself cremated after having, you know. Well, one of the things I, I found really interesting about that, um, because, yeah, they do cremate the bodies afterward, um, is that they, so each station with each cadaver has a bag attached to it, and they are, they are, it's asked of them to try to save as much of the kind of waste from the body um, through the process of cremation, right? They're constantly digging fat away and scraping fat away from things so that all of the body can be cremated together. Um, and this has been, I mean, this has been a taboo for a very, very long time in Western culture, this idea that, um, that the body needs to, all the parts of the body need to, to remain together. We saw this in this Republic of Suffering. I seem to remember in Dickens' novel, Our Mutual Friend, um, so there's a character in that book who is an articulator of bones, um, and there is, there is something in that novel, it's been a long time since I've read it, that touches on this, this, this idea that, um, that bodies need to remain uh, whole. 
Um, and I think much of it comes from this idea of, of, of bodily resurrection uh, from the Christian tradition that, that a body will be raised in full, and so it all needs to be there. But she says even in the book that there's no way for them to save everything because much of the, like a lot of the dried blood and stuff gets rinsed down uh, the drain when they're, when they're cleaning uh, various parts of the bones. I remember um, I was at uh, a Mormon funeral once and um, it was an open casket funeral and uh, the um, person who was sort of um, overseeing the funeral, well, memorial service, I guess it was. Um, he was, you know, an ordained priest uh, of the highest order in the Mormon, the Mormon Church, and uh, he talked about how um, <clears throat> the body, um, you know, in I guess he was talking about Mormon, the Mormon perspective on this sort of ritual of having the open casket, and it's this idea that um, yes, like according to our scriptures and our beliefs. The body really has no intrinsic value, but it's helpful for the people who loved this person to um, to grieve for him to have the body sort of there, and uh, yeah, and, uh, it sounds similar to that, um, where like I don't know they they intellectually accept that this body really means nothing, but it helps them emotionally. Um, I mean, I think that's that's where that comes from with funerals and, and whatnot that we want to. Um, I mean, the process of embalming, and we saw that with uh, this Republic of Suffering as well. Um, the first embalmers, right, in, in America, and, uh, and the botched job that many of them would make of it. Um, people want to, especially when I think they, I think when they see their loved ones decline in health, right, um, the ravages of disease uh, in the hospital and whatnot, I think that they want to, to be left with an image of their loved one to carry with them. And... Um, yeah, I remember when, when I was a kid, my grandpa uh, died, my grandpa on my mom's side, and, um, and I still remember approaching his body in the funeral home, his body in the casket, and, uh, and I had written a letter to him and drawn like a picture, I think, of us playing baseball or something. And I slipped it inside his jacket pocket and I put it in his coat. And, um, and, I, and I sometimes, I mean, this was, you know, 1980 three or something like this, and I sometimes find myself wondering uh, if that paper is still there, you know, if the paper itself hasn't degraded away in the way that the body has. It, it felt important to me, even as a child, to have that with his body, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and I couldn't explain it then, and I'm not even really sure I could explain it now, but I do find it fascinating how there is this I don't know. There, there's just this, this this reverence for the physical for the physical person, um, and again, because I think, I think the fact that it harkens back to our memories, and the the things that you know that really define the person to us and our relationship with them, the experiences we had with them, the intimacy that we had with them, the body itself points to those things. I think that that has a great deal of uh, significance in 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 why. Preserving the body is so important to us. Um, yeah, it's preserving funny. our memory of it. Anyway. It's funny because she also touches on every now and then um, the sort of controversies that developed around using cadavers, like um, uh, what was the guy's name? Vesalius. Yeah, Mr. Vesalius. How at one point he like during the Italian Renaissance, I think. Yeah, like I think the church authorities were sending people to um, take him away to wherever for for defiling these dead bodies and then he you know fled fled these whoever was chasing these whatever whoever chasing after him and ran to the shrine of a saint who literally like you could touch or maybe you can touch but his like esophagus was on display his tongue his larynx uh and something else yeah yeah and and he went to like pray at this shrine and suddenly he was a he well he prayed at the shrine of this saint who, you know, whose body parts had been, you know, put on display. Um, and suddenly they couldn't do anything to him because he just, you know, absolved himself of all his sins by, from, at the shrine of, uh, of this person where the church had done sort of the same thing that he yeah. had been doing to those other corpses. And also, Christian Mantras tell us about visiting the shrine of um, Saint Catherine, I think. 
Yeah, I haven't um, got there yet. They're rereading. Where they literally have, like, the body sitting, you know, sitting inside of a monastery, like, presumably they did something to mummify it, but there's literally the body of the saint sitting there. And, um, I guess it, you know, I guess in a sense there are different degrees of reverence for bodies, because clearly, um, because, like, my sense of Christianity and Judaism and in particular, because they're the ones I know the most about, is that you preserve the body so that when they're resurrected and, you know, on Judgment Day or something, um, they will have their body to return, their soul will have their body to return to. But the saints, that doesn't apply because they're at such a, I guess, high level of reverence. Yeah, yeah. A level 10 holiness. Yeah. yeah. I found myself thinking, um... So a couple of weeks ago, uh, my friend Dan and I watched, and I had seen it multiple times before, but we watched The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. And at the end of that film, we learned when Jesse James' body, um, so after he'd been killed, um, his body was put on display, it was photographed, um, photos of it were sold, thousands, I think thousands of copies of the photos were sold, um, people wanted their picture taken with him, with his corpse. And um, in reading this book, it made me think about these things that we do, whether it's through celebrity, um, you know, or whether it's through acts of violence, the things that people, that human beings do to, to, to desecrate other bodies. If in fact there's nothing more to it after death, right, if it's nothing but um, matter, then one has to wonder, like, why should it matter? Right? Where does this idea of desecration come from if there's nothing to it? And it reminded me of, um, so after 9-11 happened and we went over, America's troops went over to the Middle East and started wreaking, wreaking havoc in, uh, in Iraq, there was a story uh, that, that caused quite a stir of, uh, of Americans, uh, American soldiers urinating on the dead bodies of, of fallen Iraqi uh, soldiers, or, or Al-Qaeda soldiers, I can't remember what it was. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, people were really up in arms about that. That it was, it was, it was conduct unbecoming of a soldier, mm -hmm. which I would totally agree with. Um, but where does that? I don't know. It's interesting. Where does that come from? If the body is nothing more than flesh, um, where does this idea that that there can be desecration yeah. uh, come from? And she talks about how some medical students, after they go through this anatomy class, a lot of them experience um, what you could call sort of uh, symptoms of PTSD from mm. dissecting these bodies. Yeah. Because um, doing something that seems uh, disrespectful to this body is so emotionally overwhelming for them. Well, she has nightmares. Mm -hmm. she, she actually has nightmares in which she is skinning people. And I can see how that would be deeply unsettling. And it's, it's interesting because she also talks about how the norms for medical practitioners is you're supposed to just be sort of a, a machine who does these things. And so there's not much attention given to how what emotional effect this all has on first-year medical students, you know. Um, well, you have to wonder how does that, how does their having to distance distance themselves from what they're doing, um, and like you said, become sort of machine like, that is directly at odds with the idea of them developing bedside manner, mm -hmm. and bedside manner is such an important part of being a good doctor, um, and many physicians don't have it; yeah. they don't have it at all. Like um, she tells an anecdote of when she was, I think, a resident. And uh, she was working with this, um, there's a family, um, parents and a, their child, their child was like an adult, but still, uh, you know, uh, the child, the child was, um, like on a, some sort of a respirator or something that was helping them breathe. And essentially the parents had decided finally, and obviously they were ill and dying, and the parents had finally decided that they should slow down the respirators slowly enough so that basically the person would slowly die because mm -hmm. they just decided they don't want to go through this anymore. And the doctor who was on duty in that ward um, you know, said, okay, we'll do that. 
and uh, he supposedly went over and, you know, set the respirator to a low enough frequency that so that the person would die, and, um, Christine, uh, talks about how, like, whatever, an hour or so later, she noticed that the person still wasn't dead, and was like, and she went and asked the doctor, was like, is this normal? Uh, like, should, should he, or should he or she, I can't remember, uh, still be alive? And he was like, oh no, I, I didn't slow it down at all, I don't want someone to die on my, on my mm -hmm. watch, because there's so much paperwork. And <laughs> just, like, it's hard to fathom that level of callousness, you know? Yeah. Um, well, we saw that, I think, a little bit in, did you read Wit? I watched the movie. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, and then that, that young, that young doctor who was kind of overseeing, uh, her case, uh, in, in that, in that movie, we see a little bit of that yeah. in, uh, in that film. This is a book that, and again, I've read it once before, I'm halfway through it again. This is a book that gives you so much food for thought, I think. And, um, and it, I mean, my God, that's one of the things I love about really great nonfiction is how much, how much you learn reading this. I mean, I don't know about you, but as I'm, as I'm reading this, I find myself putting the book down and, and, and feeling like my chest or feeling my shoulders and things, trying to find, or when they're talking about the, you know, he, he, at one point he takes her wrist and he says, he says, let's see if you have such and such tendon in your wrist because not everybody does. And, um, and she says, you know, underneath some faint blue lines of veins or whatever, you can see this. And I think I have it. I think I have it. Um, but I found myself just, just marveling at all of the, the material they have to, to memorize and learn. It became very clear to me that, uh, this is not something I could have ever done. No. I could never have become a doctor. No. Um, my brain just doesn't work that way. It's yeah. difficult enough for me to remember all my passwords. Uh, <laughs> You know, than having to remember 10,000 new terms yeah. in your first year yeah. of medical school. But it's a fascinating book, uh, and I think well worth a read. If you, if you haven't read it, uh, you should. Uh, and if you have read it uh, for the project, uh, let Lukash and I know what you think yeah. in, the comments, uh, in the comments below. But uh, thank you, my friend, yeah. for appearing in the video. Yeah, thank you yeah, maybe we'll go upstairs uh, now and make some gin and tonics, maybe. And uh, maybe watch a movie or something. Yeah. I will see uh, all of you guys again very soon in my next video. And uh, if you haven't checked out Lukasha's channel, Totally Pretentious, you absolutely should. Uh, he is one of the one of the booktubers who I, I think I've known the longest, whose channel I just uh, absolutely love. So if you like what I do, chances are you will really love what he does as well. So uh, we will see you guys again very soon. Adiós.